swinging place to be. 1963 was the year of mod culture, miniskirts, and the Profumo sex scandal. The Beatles became a worldwide phenomenon. Others also claimed a following in London's underworld. We had our famous Cray twins running uh, London on one side and a couple of small time gangs. There's a lot of heavy action, armed uh, robberies, uh, payroll stuck up, banks were being stuck. You couldn't go off Thursday morning in the 60s without a bank being robbed. Not all criminals relied on such murderous strong-arm tactics. Master thief Bruce Reynolds had carved out his niche among a different breed of outlaws. The people I was mixing with at the time were very much what I would term um, gentlemen of crime. That virtually all of them uh, wore Savile Row suits, so they were all driving cars like Jaguars, Alvises, Bentleys. Until 1962, Reynolds had concentrated on glamorous, albeit minor, crimes. Bruce was a quiet sort of chap who could go to the south of France, cars mixed with company there, um, and in no time at all, find out when they're going out and next the people, and then go and t turn their place over for jewellery, many, many thousands of pounds worth, you know. He was really astute thief. Although Reynolds was only in his early 30s at the time, he'd already clocked up 10 years behind bars. It was in jail that Reynolds learned valuable information from some of the most notorious thieves, fraudsters, and safe crackers. In the early 60s, crime was very much more finessing. One didn't sort of take abnormal chances. And of course, this was an area that perhaps I fitted in as being a younger man. I was quite prepared to take the chances that perhaps my mentors weren't, which of course is every young man's uh, ambition is to be one of the big boys. And uh, that's how you become one of the big boys, by doing the things that the other people won't do. Reynolds' opportunity to become a big boy presented itself on November the 27th, 1962, when along with several associates, he robbed a payroll shipment at London Airport. Although the job netted 62,000 pounds, a tidy sum at the time, Reynolds and his friends longed for an even bigger payday. Word of a new caper, known as a tickle to those in the business, reached Reynolds through two of his accomplices from the airport robbery, Gordon Goody and Buster Edwards. In exchange for a cut of the take, a solicitor provided Goody and Edwards with inside information about large amounts of money being transported by a Royal Mail train from Glasgow to London. It was just what Bruce Reynolds had been waiting for. Well, it sounds marvellous because the figure that was mentioned was one million to six million. Uh, even then, although we were perhaps the most successful team in London, this was money beyond our wildest dreams. With the ultimate challenge in his criminal career ahead of him, Reynolds assembled together a diverse and talented gang to help him execute the job. I think it's true to say that among the famous faces of the 1960s on the London crime scene, that Charlie Wilson and Buster Edwards were two of the most lively and charming, that Gordon Goody was one of the most appealing to women, that Roy John James was an unusual getaway car driver who really could have had a great career in motor racing. I think that the great train robbers were an interesting group by criminal standards. Reynolds and his team made numerous reconnaissance trips, 
searching for the perfect spot to relieve the mail train of its payload. Travelling up and down the route, it wasn't until we got the other side of Tring that we started seeing the sort of countryside with the access that we needed. The perfect spot was Bridigo Bridge, 50 miles outside of London. Reynolds quickly realised he and his team could not do the job alone. The second gang they needed to be associated with was Tommy Wisby's South East London gang, who had expertise in stopping trains. In fact, it was a man called Roger Cordry who was the train-stopping expert. Sixteen men had now been recruited, many to lift the heavy cash-laden mailbags. To avoid suspicion, phone calls had to be made in coded language. Meetings had to be conducted in secret at different locations. When we had to have a, a large-scale meeting, i.e. when there might be 10, 12 of us, we'd go over to Wimbledon Common and uh, we'd take a, a football with us, which we'd kick that around a little bit, and then we'd huddle together as if we were talking about football tactics, when, of course, then we would be talking about the actual robbery and what part people were playing it. Roger Cordry, the Wisby Gang's technical expert, came up with the idea of rigging phony signals to stop the train. On seeing the red light, the driver would have to bring the train to a halt. From his informant, Reynolds knew that the first two carriages contained the money. Along with the engine, they would have to be detached and driven a mile to Bridigo Bridge to avoid the numerous postmen sorting mail in the other carriages. Once the train reached the bridge, the money would be loaded into three waiting vehicles. A problem soon presented itself. Although the men had learned how to uncouple the train's carriages, they would need more assistance, should the driver prove uncooperative. We kicked it around amongst ourselves. Could we make the driver drive it? Well, sometimes you can. Sometimes you can threaten someone, say, well, you have to do it. But you also come across some people that just won't cooperate. So I said, I think we should um, have another driver, just in case we can't get the driver to drive it. In the search for a driver, Bruce Reynolds turned to his old friend, Ronnie Biggs. He wasn't, by the time of the robbery, a professional robber himself normally. He was pulled in because he had earlier met Bruce Reynolds in prison, and Ronnie Biggs knew a train driver, and they needed one. All the pieces were now in place to pull off the most daring robbery of the 20th century. By August 1963, the men were ready. Bruce Reynolds and his team of 15 men had purchased Leather Slade Farm, 17 miles from where they planned to hold up the Royal Mail train to use as a base. For four days, Reynolds and some of the gang had been holed up at their farmhouse hideout, poring over last-minute details of the operation. They disguised themselves as an army unit and painted their two Land Rovers and truck to look like military vehicles. Shortly after midnight on August the 8th, 
The men loaded up their equipment and headed for Bridigo Bridge. Meanwhile, the Royal Mail train had pulled into Crewe, one of its last stops before continuing on to London. Back at Bridigo Bridge, the men waited. If all went well, they could retire to lives of leisure and comfort. One hitch, and they could all expect lengthy stays in prison. The two Land Rovers and army truck were parked at the base of the bridge. Several men fanned out to get the lay of the land. Reynolds and two others cut the wires of all telephones in the area. With outside communications disabled, Reynolds figured his group would have a 30-minute head start should anything go wrong. Once the preparations were complete, the 16 men took their places and waited. Shortly after 3 a.m., they heard the train approaching. I heard it first, and then I could see the lights in the distance. It's quite a brightly lit train because people are working inside of it, so it lights up the countryside. So it's quite a thrilling moment for me actually seeing it come to fruition. You're thinking to yourself, well, we hope everything goes right. Um, the die is now cast. Reynolds radioed ahead to Roger Cordry to activate the phony red signal light. As the, the express is coming down, and the mailmen are putting in the mail, almost like your Western stories, when it did come to a stop because the lights had been put there, the driver thought, what's this all about? But he had to stop, it was the red sign. As soon as the driver saw the red light, he brought the engine and its seven carriages to a screeching halt. The first group sprang into action. It was a contained e excitement, and uh, I thought, this is going to be the greatest moment in my life. This is everything as a criminal, you know, this is my Sistine Chapel, this is El Dorado, it's everything. And then I felt my knees buckle momentarily, but the nervous feeling goes, the queasiness goes, and uh, something else takes over. You, you're then working on pure adrenaline. Roy, the weasel James, uncoupled the engine and the two carriages carrying the money. Buster Edwards and several others overpowered the driver, Jack Mills, and his fireman, David Whitby. The men were ready to drive the engine and carriages a mile up the track to Bridigo Bridge, where Bruce Reynolds and the rest of the team were waiting. When Mills refused to cooperate, one of the men panicked and hit him over the head with a blunt instrument. Jack Mills had been hit over the head, which I wasn't very happy about because the whole idea of the plan was that no one should be hurt. The train's controls were now in the hands of the gang's driver. He was an old man who didn't obviously know the modern controls of a train, and as a result, when they sat him on the seat and said, drive it on, he was fumbling, and in the end, they threw him off the train and to put the driver back on. Jack Mills was forced to drive to the bridge. Once there, the thieves jumped out of the two carriages loaded with money-filled mailbags and ordered the postal workers to lay on the ground. The gang formed a human chain to pass the 40-pound mailbags out of the train and down the embankment. Bruce Reynolds checked his watch. Everything was running according to plan. After the half hour that Reynolds had allowed for, he called time. Once the mailbags were safely stowed away, the men jumped into their waiting vehicles and drove off into the summer night. It was 3.45 a.m. With military-like precision, 120 mailbags of cash had been stolen in just 30 minutes quite quiet really and uh, we could hear the, the others singing in the back of the lorry and they were singing it, it's the good life and exactly as we pulled into the yard of the farm it came over the radio, attention, attention, a train has been stopped and you won't believe it, they've stolen the train.
By 4 a.m., Bruce Reynolds, Gordon Goody, Buster Edwards, and the 13 other men had arrived safely at their farmhouse hideout. With the men were the cash-filled mailbags. It was time to divide the booty. I left it to Buster and Gordon, and I said, well, you know, I'm going to bed, and uh, give us a call when we know how much it is. And uh, I think I was been asleep about two hours, and uh, Buster come and woke me up and said that uh, it comes to two and a half million. The men divided the two and a half million pounds, with 150,000 pounds going to each man. The original plan was that the men would hide out at the farmhouse for a couple of weeks. Each would then go their separate ways. But worried that a dragnet tactic by police would result in their hideout being discovered, the men abandoned their plan and fled the quiet countryside the day after the robbery, careful to cover their tracks before leaving. I never took my gloves off at any time I was up there, and I don't think any of the others did. Just to make sure, before I left, everyone went round with cloths and wiped down every surface that was in there. And as I wiped the surface down, someone followed me and completed the manoeuvre, someone else followed him and completed the manoeuvre. So we was quite certain there wasn't going to be any fingerprints left behind. The men were left with one last dilemma, the mailbags, evidence that directly linked them to the crime. The activities of the police were much, much more ferocious than we'd envisaged. We had no idea that it was going to attract that much attention, that in effect no one wanted to be caught with the mailbags themselves. It was decided that Buster Edwards would arrange for someone to return in a few days to dispose of the incriminating evidence. But that day never came. Within a few hours of the hold-up, Buckinghamshire police had descended upon Bridigo Bridge. They combed every inch of the Royal Mail train looking for evidence. Realising the crime was much too large for them to handle alone, they called in Scotland Yard. With two and a half million pounds missing and a badly injured man, the Yard wasted little time in commencing its pursuit of the train robbers. Scotland Yard's famed Flying Squad, a detective unit whose investigations ranged from counterfeiting to murder, led the way. Harry Clement joined the squad shortly after the robbery. There was a lot of um, pressure. That's why they called in the flying squad, because we were mobile, we can cross police boundaries anywhere in the country. And uh, they realized that it wasn't just a home-knit parochial robber gang. This was something different. News of the robbery was splashed across the front page of every newspaper. As detectives fanned out across the surrounding area, a reward of £250,000 was offered. The entire nation was swept up in the great train robbery frenzy. They caught the imagination of the British public because it was so audacious. Who would have believed that any robbers, even in those 60s when we had a lot of strange robbers around, would have jumped onto a train, stopped it, and then rob it? The public were amazed by what had happened. The only train robbery they'd heard about was Jesse James and a good old Western. The great train robbery became very, very famous. 
I think initially because of the amount of money that was stolen. We're talking about two and a half million pounds. Now, that, that is peanuts today. But in 1963, that was a hell of a lot of money. You had the media jumping onto this, which went on for days and days and days. The media following the police, what are they doing, what are they doing, etc., etc. So the hype builds up. No one felt the increasing pressure more than the flying squad leader, Chief Superintendent Tommy Butler. He wouldn't let go. He was tenacious. And he, he had the backing of his men. And they wouldn't let go. It's a different set of men as this today, of course. They're different kind of detectives. You have to have known Tommy Butler. You know, he lived, breathed. The flying squad was his life. You could come in there most evenings and you'd find him in his office, writing away or reading something. The Grey Fox, some called him. Terrific man. Terrific. Smiled sometimes. <laughs> Butler and his men received their first big break in the case on Monday, August the 12th. A local herdsman reported suspicious vehicles parked at Leatherslade Farm. The following morning, Leatherslade Farm was swarming with police and forensic experts. Among them was Jack Slipper, a detective on the flying squad. They completely sealed it, brought fingerprint officers from Scotland Yard and said, look, I don't care how long you're in there, we want that place pulled over every fraction and we want to know exactly what prints are in there. And don't say later we could have done better if we'd had more time. And I, I heard that instruction being given down there, so it was true. Despite the last-minute clean-up operation by Reynolds and his men, the fingerprint experts were greeted by a treasure trove of evidence. In addition to the vehicles and mailbags, investigators found half-burnt ski masks, as well as fingerprints implicating eight of the robbers, taken from, amongst other things, a ketchup bottle and a Monopoly game. Fingerprints were coming back, and then they see, then once they got those fingerprints, even much harder, it's not like computer now, uh, but as long as you've got some suspects to put up, and what we've done, we've just put up whole teams, names, maybe 30 people, so they could check on the print on that tin and this tin. And of course, one by one, they were coming back. Among the fingerprints taken from the farmhouse were those of Gordon Goody, Bruce Reynolds, Robert Welsh, Thomas Wisby, James Hussey, Ronnie Biggs, Roy James, John Daly and Charlie Wilson. By the next morning, the names and the photographs of the wanted men were on the front pages. No one was more surprised than Bruce Reynolds, who by now was hiding out in London. We were suspected from the word go. I mean, the police knew immediately that there was only two or three groups in London that could carry out this type of robbery. And we knew that we was going to obviously have some heavy questioning if we were available for questioning, which, of course, I never was. On the day the fingerprints were discovered, the first arrests were also made. Roger Cordry, the man who had engineered the phony signals that had stopped the train, and his friend, William Ball, were captured in Bournemouth when they attempted to pay three months' rent for a garage in cash. When the police come round and they found that the Rogers got over a hundred thousand pounds in his car, so they were nicked immediately. This was the age when everyone was media orientated. As I viewed it, Vietnam was the first media war. This was the first media crime. The flying squad worked relentless seven-day weeks in the hope of rounding up the missing suspects. 
Their efforts were soon rewarded. By December, all but three of the robbers had been captured. But only 250,000 pounds had been recovered. It became like an ongoing serial, almost a criminal soap opera with people falling like dominoes. Once they'd nicked this one, then they nicked another one. The trial was held at Aylesbury on January the 20th, 1964. The proceedings would last 51 days, with Jack Mills, the driver who had been brutally attacked during the robbery, giving emotional testimony about his ordeal. All but one of the defendants were convicted. The remaining 12 were sentenced to a total of 307 years in prison, with most of the men receiving 25 to 30 years each. The country was shocked at the length of the prison terms handed down by Justice Edmund Davis. Summing up, he said, let us clear out of the way any romantic notions. This is nothing less than a sordid crime of violence inspired by vast greed. Leniency would be evil. Detective Harry Clement was present for the sentencing. And I couldn't believe it and I looked around and my partner, came forward and he said, yes, 25, 30, and we're all looking around, and the, the court was aghast. I mean, uh, to get a 25-year or 30-year, you've got to be a terrorist who've, uh, who've put a, a bomb and killed many people. I think he was the heaviest that, that we had known at that time for ordinary criminals. But Scotland Yard's manhunt was not yet complete. Bruce Reynolds, Buster Edwards and James White were still at large, and two million pounds was still missing. For many detectives, the 12 convictions handed down to the great train robbers would have been satisfaction enough, but not for Tommy Butler. He was determined to bring the three remaining robbers to justice. Once my photo appeared in, in the newspaper, I, I realised that um, it was going to be very difficult for me with the amount of money that was being offered for a reward, for one thing. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that no one, even my closest friends, really wanted to be associated with me. More than a hundred detectives scoured the country following up leads on Reynolds, Buster Edwards and James White. They found themselves playing a high-stakes game of cat and mouse with Bruce Reynolds, the elusive mastermind of the two and a half million pound robbery. I'm certain I missed him by inches in a traffic jam. I'm sure it was him, because I haven't looked at his face so many times, but the traffic just blocked. I couldn't reverse, couldn't go forward, and that was it. So Reynolds had, had a charmed life in some ways. But he's a very, very, very shrewd, shrewd man. When we burst in, no one was in the place. Teapot was there. Kettle was on the stove. I touched the teapot. It was red hot, full up. Cups were set out. The bird had flown. I have spoken to that bird on a few occasions since. Bruce Reynolds. I said, was it you? He said, yes. He said, that's, that Saturday afternoon, he said, I was probably walking away from that house as you were getting out of your cars to come down the road. It was as close as that. On July the 8th, 1964, Ronnie Biggs escaped from Wandsworth Prison in broad daylight. Using a homemade rope ladder, Biggs and three other prisoners went over the wall and jumped into a waiting furniture van. Using his underworld connections, Biggs escaped to Paris and underwent plastic surgery to alter his appearance before fleeing to Australia.
Six weeks after Biggs' escape, Charlie Wilson also escaped and fled to Canada. Perhaps it was now time for Reynolds to leave the country. He had exhausted most of his hideouts and was tiring of Scotland Yard's relentless pursuit. Reynolds fled to France and eventually Mexico, where he was joined by his wife Frances and two-year-old son Nick. Home movies chronicle their life abroad. It appealed much more to my romantic nature in Mexico. I was quite into the whole thing of like Pancho Villa and, and Zapata and uh, plus the fact that, that much like America, that they, they had sort of armies of uh, people that had been fugitives of various sort of uh, oppressive regimes at the time. Using the money from the train robbery, Reynolds and his family quickly acclimatized themselves to the good life in Mexico City. His son Nick remembers their life on the run. The whole time while we was on the run um, was a bit like a spy game for me. Everywhere we went, uh, I'd be instructed we'd have new names, new identities that came with the passports. The Reynolds remained in Mexico for three years, where they were briefly joined by Buster Edwards and his family. By September 1966, Edwards had tired of the life of a fugitive and turned himself in to the police in exchange for a reduced sentence of 15 years. The previous April, James White had finally been captured. The only robbers still at large were Bruce Reynolds, Charlie Wilson and Ronnie Biggs. Public sentiment was, surprisingly, strongly in favour of the robbers. The men who had stolen two and a half million pounds of the government's money were seen as modern-day Robin Hoods. Whose side are you instinctively on, the escaped man or the police? On the escaped man, I think. Um, I'd like to give, I'd like to encourage the police, but I think the escape, I'd like him to have a, a good run for his money. <laughs> when in so many regards, one thinks jolly good luck. Uh, one again is speaking loosely, and let's hope the police are not watching. <laughs> Despite the views of the man on the street, Tommy Butler remained committed to the biggest manhunt in the history of Scotland Yard. Although he was long overdue for retirement, he vowed to stay on the job until all the men had been brought to justice. His perseverance paid off when he received word of Charlie Wilson's whereabouts. We were at a function, a flying squad um, stag do, when the phone call came in and Tommy Butler was with us and he got up and he said, gentlemen, I have to go. They've captured Charlie Wilson in Canada. So Tommy, he wouldn't miss out on anything. He's one that went, I told you, to uh, Canada to arrest Wilson. So he wanted to be there when everybody had been nicked. Having skillfully evaded Scotland Yard for nearly six years, Bruce Reynolds decided to return to England. Unlike Buster Edwards, he had no intention of turning himself in. My reason for coming back to England uh, after what we might say quite an adventurous period was that uh, money had been running out. I've been, I've been living in an ex president of Mexico's penthouse suite and I was living like the top five percent so I thought I've got to come back to England and uh, sort out this other robbery which had been on the books which supposedly uh, the guy said it could be bigger than the train so there you go such is the nature of the romantic they think they can come back and do it all over again Had Bruce Reynolds overestimated his streak of good luck? Or had he underestimated the bulldog-like resolve of Tommy Butler? When Reynolds returned to England in 1968, none of those friends were prepared to help him. Any connection with... Also 
working age Reynolds was Toby Butler's elaborate and simple network of informants. It was early one morning, I think six o'clock in the morning. There was a knock at the door, and my wife went down and opened the door, and the police just charged in. Uh, Tom came in after me and said, Well, got you, Bruce. And I think my reaction was, Say la vie. And I asked him, Could I say goodbye to my son? And he said, Yes, you can. And I said, What, in the other room? And he said, Oh, no, not in the other room. And I told my son that Dad had been a naughty boy and he'd done things in the past. He was six years old at the time, Nick. It was only as we were driving back in the car, one of the policemen said to me, um, you know, you're not going to see your dad for quite a while. Um, so that, 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 was a, that was all a bit drastic, really, because we'd been on the run for six years, travelling around, living the life of Riley, really, and um, coming to England within a very short time. You know, that was it. Goodbye, Dad. In January 1969, Bruce Reynolds pleaded guilty to conspiracy and robbery. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison. The mastermind of the great train robbery was finally behind bars. Outside the courtroom, Reporters converged on Tommy Butler, asking if his hunt was over. His response was unwavering. No, got to catch Biggs first. But Butler was unable to keep his promise. Exhausted by his six-year quest, he retired. He died the following year. By 1970, Ronnie Biggs had moved from Australia to Rio de Janeiro. The last of the great train robbers was living in a country that had no extradition treaty with England. Biggs had it made, or so it seemed. When Biggs got away, the public said, good old Biggsy. There's been several attempts to get him back, uh, official and unofficial, some vigilantes thought they'd pick him up and bring him back, and they weren't successful. The police have tried. Jack Slipper went to see him. But, of course, Jack couldn't get past the extradition law. And here, 30 years on, Biggs is still over there, but he's not a well man, I'm told. Today, Biggs is recovering from a stroke. But until recently, he had hosted visitors from around the world regaling them with his tale of the great train robbery, for a small fee, of course. Bruce Reynolds served just nine years and received an early release from prison on June the 6th, 1978. In 1993, he and Ronnie Biggs were reunited. Cheers, folks. Later that same year, Reynolds wrote his life story, Autobiography of a Thief. Well, one of the reasons why I wrote my book was to actually work out how does a boy from a non-criminal background become one of the world's most wanted criminals. Reynolds' son, Nick, doesn't resent his father for his former career. But all I can say is I'm, I'm proud that he what he did um, he's achieved something with his life. He's also paid the price for it. I don't have any regrets I, I, in the long run. I mean, all you can do is, is live your life to the best, which I think he's tried, and I admire him for that. 35 years have passed since the great train robbery shocked the world and pitted the men of Scotland Yard against Britain's most devious criminals. In that time, a mutual respect has developed between the former adversaries. Other than hitting the driver, Driver Mills, it was a very clever, skillful piece of work. Everything was spot on. Um, to me, uh, Bruce Reynolds was fantastic. I mean, to keep uh, away as long as he did, even as far away as Mexico. 
Now in his 60s, Bruce Reynolds lives a quiet life, with his days of hiding out well behind him. But he is still always asked one question. I've been asked many times would I do it again, and of course uh, the, the age I am now, with the experience I've got now, uh, I won't say maturity, but with the age I've got, so I haven't got time to do these things anymore. But I also know myself, and if I was 32 years of age, living in the same uh, milieu that I was living in then, with the same ambitions, of course I would do it again. At 8 o'clock tomorrow evening, one of the biggest mysteries of the Second World War, the disappearance of the American bomber Lady Be Good in the Libyan desert. Next this evening, a small piece of history.